Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Heartland Institute President James Taylor. Thank you. Welcome back to the Heartland Institute's 15th International Conference on Climate Change. So, does everybody in the house know that Wednesday was National Margarita Day? I mean, looking out the windows in the back, you see the pool. I'm longing to be out there. After the conference, I will be. But uh, it's something. Uh, I mentioned this morning how we at the Heartland Institute, each day, Anthony Watts, Sterling Burnett, Linnea Lucan, myself, we will do a Google News search for climate change and see what misinformation, what propaganda the media is peddling on a given day, and then we debunk it on our website, climaterealism.com. So this morning, just uh, after being up here a few hours ago, I was doing a Google News search for climate change, and what popped up? There's a CNN article, and this is what alerted me to the fact that it was National Margarita Day Wednesday. So let me pull this up here. This is amazing. So the title of the article on CNN.com, Why the Climate Crisis May Be Coming for Your Margarita Next. <laughs> Here's the lead. Something to consider as you search for happy hours to celebrate National Margarita Day. The delicious concoction's main ingredient is threatened by changing weather. It's amazing. The agave plant is threatened by changing weather. You know, this is what the media does. Anything that we like, they go out of their way to try and make it seem like you're never going to have it again. Climate change is to blame. What a crisis. So it's National Margarita Day. Rather than allowing people to enjoy it, they throw the climate change scare at you. Well, I did a quick review of agave plant production, tequila production, because after all, that's what they're saying. Climate change is destroying your tequila. You're never going to have a margarita again. This is amazing. You can't make this up, folks. Do you have any idea what's happening with tequila production over the past, I don't know, 5, 10, 20 years? Since 1995, margarita production has increased sixfold. Sixfold. Here's another one. Since 2018, not even five years ago, uh, I'm sorry, I said margarita production, tequila production. Since 2018, tequila production has more than doubled in just five years. And in case you think I'm cherry picking and, and taking an, an off year, 2018 had the second highest tequila production on record up to that point, and it's more than doubled since then. So what do we get on National Margarita Day? Climate change is coming for your margarita. Everybody panic. Like I said, they do this for anything we love. I, I saw last week as, as I was doing the same Google News search, climate change, what came up? All over the place, articles about how because of climate change, you're no longer going to be able, your cup of morning joe, you know, no longer be able to enjoy it. You won't even have it. Because of climate change, coffee production is in grave jeopardy. It's already being ravaged. Well, I knew this was a farce because just a year or two at climaterealism.com, we saw a similar spate of articles, and we looked up the data, and we debunked it because we know for a fact it's been proven, it's been shown by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization that coffee production sets new records virtually every year. Almost every year a new record is set. The same has been the case in 2021 and 2022. Now what's amazing here is I saw this article, and I knew immediately that it was false, and we'd be debunking that. Underneath Google News, on the, on the, near the very top of the, uh, the search results, there's a section that says, people also ask. And here's a, here's a question. Is coffee declining? Now again, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization reports that globally, and really for virtually every country that produces coffee, coffee production sets new records virtually every year and continues to do so. Here's how Google News answers the question, is coffee declining? 
By 2050, in all three climate scenarios, the number of regions most highly suited for growing coffee declined by 50%. Wait a second, it's not 2050 yet. They're not even answering the question. Our predictions are, but that's what passes for following the science these days. Amazing. Another one uh, in Australia. A few years ago, there were some very serious wildfires widespread throughout the country. And everybody in the media, climate activists, they blamed, of course, climate change. You guessed it. The Australian Bureau of Meteorology has very detailed, precise records going back approximately a century. And they also produce this, these data in map form. And you can see that early in the 20th century, drought, which of course is the climate change element for which they blame the wildfires, drought was substantially more frequent and severe in the early half of the 20th century than has been the case since. In fact, if you look at the past 20 years, it's been remarkable how frequently rainfall throughout Australia has been above the annual average. When we finally had, after so many years of quite, well, more than sufficient rainfall, you finally had a year to a drought, there were so much, there were so much trees and vegetation out there that of course you had all the fuel for the fires. And then of course you have mismanagement by the Australian government, much, with it, much like they do in California. But what you see for a fact is that those wildfires were an aberration. Australia has become wetter and experienced more abundant precipitation as the world has warmed. The media lies about it. NASA satellites have measured a 24% decline in the amount of land globally that's been burned by wildfire since the year 1998. Again, these are facts that exist that are available to the media and yet they report lies. Another one, maple syrup. February is the peak of maple syrup production. It's where they tap the sugar maples. February is where you get the most, uh, the most flow. So doing our daily Google News search, we at Heartland saw a spate of articles this past week about how climate change is ravaging maple syrup production. You'll no longer be able to enjoy maple syrup with your morning pancakes. And so we looked at the data. And virtually every year, maple syrup production sets new records. It's not just a one-off when we at the Heartland Institute and elsewhere point out the lies that are being told by the media, by climate activists. I mentioned this morning this book, Climate at a Glance, for teachers and students. This is the book that we sent to thousands of teachers around the country. This is the book that teachers write us back and say, thank you so much for sending to us. Everybody should have gotten a copy in your bag. I heard from a few folks this morning that they didn't have a copy uh, from a few speakers. Speakers, you're entitled to gift bags as well. Pick it up, get a copy of this book. We also have extra copies in the back. We have extra bags and we have extra, extra copies standing alone. If you'd like an additional copy or two, pick it up. I've had people that come to us and say, hey, can we get another 100 copies so I can send it to all the science teachers, high school, junior high school, and our school district. We do that. This is the resource that debunks all that garbage. Thank you. So I mentioned Australian wildfires. And that came to mind as I was uh, thinking about how fortunate we are to have our first keynote speaker here today at lunch. Our speaker uh, spoke, I believe it was the fourth International Conference on Climate Change. He spoke with us here, uh, Dr. Ian Plymer. And this is amazing. If, if money were a limitless resource for us here at the Heartland Institute, the way the media says it is, the way we have all the fossil fuel funding pouring in, we would have 500 speakers, and this conference would go on for two weeks, and we'd still be leaving some people out in the cold. But, but you know, we, have to make, we have to make some you know, dividing line. Okay, we can get you in. We don't have time. Expenses being what they are. Australia is a long way away, and it's, it's rather expensive to fly people in from Australia. We have scientists, economists, policy experts from all over the world. And as we're going through our list of who to speak and who not to speak, as we're putting this together, we heard from somebody in Australia. 
Dr. Ian Plymer. The world needs more Dr. Ian Plymers. He, now, here in particular is the reason why. He says, hey guys, guess what? I love your climate conferences. I've been there before. I'm going to be in the United States. In fact, I'm going to attend your climate conference. So it's, I'm paying for my own travel. If you need a speaker, I'm here. I'm ready to speak. And I'm thinking it's like Aaron Judge calling up the owner of the Yankees and saying, hey, um, you know, I love playing baseball and uh, I happen to be, I plan to be around Yankee Stadium sometime around opening day. If you just happen to need a left fielder, I'm available for free. The world needs more Dr. Ian Plymers. <laughs> Dr. Ian Plymer is a former professor of geology uh, at the University of Melbourne, excuse me, of an emeritus professor of earth sciences at the University of Melbourne, a former professor of mining geology at the University of Adelaide. Dr. Plymer has written several books. He is one of the best, as I've mentioned some of the propaganda that has been floated around that we shoot down at the Heartland Institute. Dr. Plymer is one of the best at doing the same. He has written several books. One of them that I hope he'll talk about a little bit more in his talk is Green Murder, a life sentence of net zero with no parole. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ian Plymer. Well, thank you for that introduction. Patrick Moore stole my whole, whole talk, so I think I'll go back. It's only 20 hours flying. Okay. There's only one button to push and I can't get it right. This is the only takeaway you need from a geologist. You will not find any people in my profession who would claim that humans can change a major planetary system. We are not crazy. There are a number of fundamentals. No one has ever shown that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. And just perish a thought, in case I'm wrong, you then have to show that the 97% of natural emissions don't drive global warming. The foundation is absolutely and totally wrong. There are major planetary processes that drive climate change and we have a great ego and we think we can drive how the planet works. But there are some fundamental things that we see in the history of the planet. A key question, when did it first rain? Because that was unprecedented when it first rained. Not much else is unprecedented. And we can take you to Western Greenland, show you these old gravels from running water. It must have rained. And at the same time, we find evidence of life on Earth. We have the chemical fingerprints of life. That is extraordinary and that is unprecedented. But most of what we hear in the press about unprecedented events, they're not. They're just because people are ignorant of history. We have some great ice ages in the past. Every single ice age occurred when we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. Every single ice age. We have six major ice ages. Some of them occurred when we had a bad planetary address. Some of them occurred when continents went over poles. But these ice ages are the clue to climate change. And the very first one we see is from Africa, the Pongolian at, at mid-latitudes. This is a debris left behind by retreating ice. And obviously the climate warmed up after that. We have no idea how this ice age started. We have no idea how it finished. And that's the fabulous part about science. We don't know very much, and it means that we have a lot more to do. But after that big ice age, what did we see? We saw colonial life. The bottom part of that diagram, we see stromatolites. 
These are bacterial colonies organised. And this life occurred when the planet warmed up. And then again, we had another big ice age. This one was when the ice was at sea level and at the equator. And the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, instead of being 0.04% as it is now, was at about 20%. So if you think carbon dioxide drives global warming, go back in time. This is debris left behind by retreating ice. And at the same time when we washed out material from this debris, we fertilised the oceans, we had a diversity of life, suddenly we started to put oxygen into the atmosphere, suddenly we had oxidation and we had banded iron formations. And these banded iron formations are a worldwide event of oxygenating the planet. That was unprecedented, but not three hot days. That's not unprecedented. And this is what happens to those iron formations. They formed during very cold times. They then got beneficiated during tropical times. And here in Western Australia, they're mined in an arid climate. And they tell me that I'd, I'm a climate denier, that I don't understand climate change. So look back in the past, we have a much better story to tell. And when we look at the history of ice in some of those light, vertical, light blue vertical lines and the dark blue vertical lines, we've got three of the big ice ages here. And the evolution of this planet is tied in to the evolution of the atmosphere the evolution of the rocks, the evolution of the oceans, and the evolution of life. You cannot only look at the atmosphere, and that's what the current day climate catastrophists do. We see that there's, there's a period of time in the early atmosphere in the Earth when the atmosphere was comprised methane and carbon dioxide and ammonia. That changed to a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, and we are now enjoying in yellow an oxygen rich atmosphere. We've had a change over time. We've had ice ages appear. The two vertical lines I'll go into a, in a minute, and we've had a number of oxygenation events tied into climate. So climate has been important for the evolution of the planet, and the warmer the climate, the better it has been. On the top left diagram, the lower layer of rocks is debris left behind by retreating ice. The upper layer is material deposited when water temperatures were only about 40 degrees Celsius. That's a climate change. And the bottom one shows some of the debris left behind, but the, the right diagram is the one that interests me. Those buff coloured rocks are a rock called dolomite. That is a calcium magnesium carbonate with 48% carbon dioxide in that solid rock. Now we can make dolomite in the laboratory, easy to do. All you've got to do is have an atmosphere very, very rich in carbon dioxide. So this is natural sequestration of carbon dioxide. We, we can just measure the sequence of those rocks, walk them out for miles and back calculate how much carbon dioxide was in the planet. That proxy is a pretty good way of working out that we had massive ice ages when the atmosphere had a very, very high carbon dioxide content. And after this great ice age, sea level rose only by 1,500 metres, covered the continents, and life evolved into complex multicellular life. And we were told that uh, this process took place and left behind multicellular fossils. And that was meant to be the Ediacaran fauna. And about 10 years ago, this was found by a former student of mine. A new reef system, much, much older than the first complex life we thought we had on Earth. Science is never settled. It can't be. And after this life, it then got cold again. And what happened? Well, sea level dropped, just a modest 1,500 metres. Bottom layer is debris left behind by ice. Top layer is very warm water precipitates of dolomite, again a total planetary change of maybe 60 or 80 degrees Celsius. And after that, when the ice melted and sea level went up, another 1,500 metres, we had the Ediacaran fauna appear. And these were chordates, some of them were chordates. This is, this is your, these are your um, ancestors. 
And some of them, and when I look around the room, it's, it's quite likely they were because a lot of this was green slime. And um, these were your ancestors. They were driven by climate change. And it's only when sea levels rose and when it became warm that we got complex life. It diversified even more into a, an explosion of life. It wasn't really an explosion of life. It was an explosion of predation where animals had shells and skeletons that had sucked carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they went on the rampage and they went eating the Ediacaran fauna. They, they completely wiped them out. This explosion of life took place over about 25 million years. It gave us reefs. Now, we've had reefs on planet Earth for only about 3,000 million years. Reefs come, reefs go. There's nothing special about a reef disappearing. Normally, they disappear when sea level drops. More of that later. And adding to a little bit of what Patrick spoke about this morning, as soon as we had life, predation, protection and warm waters, life just expanded. And we had a huge explosion of life and it is still expanding. We are gaining more species now than we are losing. We are losing species that you can see, big things, but some of these big animals are not very cuddly. So any paleontologist will show you life on Earth is expanding and we have our extinctions. We've had major mass extinctions and minor mass extinctions. And there are five major mass extinctions of complex life and over 20 minor mass extinctions. We also have species turnover. And species appear on planet Earth, then they disappear. This is the normal species turnover. That's not an extinction event. And these extinction events, we've got them very well documented. Uh, they didn't happen instantaneously. They happened over a period of time. But we lost huge families and genera and species during a mass extinction event. We can argue about the origin of these, but we are not in an extinction event, much as we'd like some of our fellow humans to go extinct. But we are in a period of normal species turnover and the number of species is increasing. But there's some intriguing work that's coming out and this is from looking at a very common mineral and the trace elements in this iron sulphide, which are a proxy for the amount of oxygen in the ocean waters. And we see that we've got four of the mass extinction events, and perhaps five of them, uh, of complex life, were when we had a very low oxygen content in the water. Now, the oxygen cycle is basically the opposite to that of the carbon dioxide cycle. That oxygen depletion may well be due to um, asteroid impacting or massive volcanicity, but we can now start to put together cycles of oxygen. You cannot only talk about the carbon cycle, you have to also talk about the oxygen cycle. But this is quite intriguing where we are seeing events occur that are related to changes in the atmosphere. But one of the points I want to stress today is tectonics. We know that the continents are moving apart we know they're stitching back together again. And what's that doing? That's when we're pulling apart the continents, we are adding heat to the oceans. We are adding submarine volcanic rocks to the ocean. They spew out at 1200 degrees Celsius. They get cooled by ocean water. We only have 3.4 million recognised submarine volcanoes and 28,000 kilometres of volcanic activity along the mid-eastern rise. Uh, mid uh, the East Pacific rise. So we are adding a huge amount of heat to the planet from deep down. My very first job was to work underground. When you're a mile underground, it is hot. That heat goes up in the crust. In rocks that are rich in uranium or thorium or potassium, they are even hotter. We have a very thin crust on the ocean floor. We are putting a lot of heat into the oceans. We are also adding volcanic rocks and when we do experiments with these volcanic rocks, we can dissolve 15% by weight carbon dioxide in those volcanic rocks. So when we talk about climate, we tend to look up in the air and, and look at the atmosphere. Look down at your feet also. So we have 
very good quantitative evidence on what's happening with seafloor spreading. When we collide continents together, we actually change the way uh, ocean currents work. When we put sediments into the ocean, we change sea levels. Uh, when we have a mass of volcanic rock enter the ocean floor, we push up sea levels. Um, s higher sea levels and covering continents with water has in the past moderated climate. So when we look at a couple of models, and you don't need to ask me my opinion on models, models are models, the only takeaway message from this is that as you start to shift continents around, you are changing ocean currents. And as you're changing ocean currents, you are changing the amount of heat that you transport in ocean currents. When you have a big blockage, you'll change the direction of an ocean current. So continents moving, and they still are, are changing the way in which we distribute heat. And one of the best examples is the breakup of the supercontinent Gondwana. And once India joined Asia, we started to get the Tibetan Plateau, change a lot of um, airflow on the planet, but we also started to cool down the planet. And that's when we had the beginning of the current ice age that we are enjoying. This is the key map of heat flow. This is how much heat is coming out from down below. I've been underground in South African mines, 14,000 feet underground, where you have to wear a refrigerated suit, otherwise you die. Uh, we are on the continents releasing a lot of heat, but 70% of this planet is covered by oceans. Most of the heat is being released from the oceans, along the mid-ocean ridges, along hot spots, uh, and there is quite a bit of evidence out there showing that seismic action in the mid-ocean ridges, if you can relate that to planetary alignments, to, to the um, lunar alignments, that this is often a trigger for the rise of molten rock or for earthquakes. And in fact, the last three major earthquakes in the world and volcanic eruptions were at a time of full moon. So we don't understand what's happening, but we do know that some of the moons of our outer planets are needed uh, from gravitational forces. And we suspect that a lot of carbon dioxide and volcanic rocks are released deep in the oceans when we have needing forces going on. So we've mentioned about the plate tectonics, but we haven't mentioned about weathering. I'll go into a diagram on that in a second. And um, the breakup of continents. Now, one of the key continental areas that's breaking up at present is Antarctica. And in Antarctica, there was a massive rift zone underneath the ice. We know of Antarctic volcanoes beneath the ice and above the ice, like Mount Erebus. We also have about 150 areas of hot rock sitting underneath that ice in Antarctica. So just because Antarctic ice is melting doesn't mean it's due to the air temperature. It could be due to other reasons. We know that um, when we have a pulling apart of the continent to give us seafloor spreading, that we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And most of the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, it doesn't end up in plants or coal or, or critters. It actually ends up in soils. And those soils end up uh, getting washed into the oceans and the oceans then are a wonderful repository of chemicals for the precipitation of carbonates on the ocean floor. We are actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We have for a very long period of time and we are getting to a very critical situation in our planet. Now these are some of the examples of um, old Great Barrier Reefs. Left hand photograph that is a Great Barrier Reef inland about 300 kilometres from the current Great Barrier Reef. The two photographs on the right are a Great Barrier Reef in Western Australia. And you can calculate from the bottom photograph, you see those limestones just going off forever. That rock's got 44% carbon dioxide in it. You can just measure the thickness of it and work out the depth of it from the geophysics and work out how much carbon dioxide had come from the atmosphere to give you those rocks. We are constantly sequestering carbon dioxide into soils, into life, into the oceans, and uh, this is a process which cannot be changed. But we are putting a lot of material into the atmosphere also. Any molten rock has dissolved gas. On one of the tables out there, there's a wonderful granite 
that was molten with a very high proportion of vapour in it. These granites, he released vapour into the atmosphere as they were rising. When we have volcanoes, they release gas as they rise, not when they erupt, but before the eruption. These are volcanoes in East Africa composed of carbonates. These are sodium, calcium and magnesium carbonates. These volcanic um, carbonate rocks are the ones we mine for rare earth elements. We understand them quite well. These carbonates have got at least 40% carbon dioxide coming from deep down in the earth. The earth is still degassing. We see that with every rock that was once molten. We also have gas volcanoes. These are a place in Takta Suleiman um, in northwestern Iran. Uh, and these were volcanoes composed only of gas. And that gas was carbon dioxide. Also in Iran, we know from measurements of earthquakes that as soon as you break the earth, you release huge amounts of gas, in this case, water vapour and carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. So we are constantly degassing planet Earth. Every time you push up mountains, you degas the planet, mainly water vapour and carbon dioxide. The hot springs in these mountains are bicarbonate hot springs. But this is a diagram that Patrick showed earlier, and this is showing us just the last 20% of time where we can see in purple, carbon dioxide is up and down like a yo-yo, um, but the general trend is down. The temperature is up and down and we have recorded the ice ages there. And this is telling us that the planet's carbon dioxide content is decreasing. If we halved the amount of carbon dioxide in the air today, we would have no uh, plant life and hence we'd have no animal life. It is not a crisis of climate it's a crisis of common sense that we face. It's not a crisis of climate, it's a crisis of using data. It's not a crisis of climate, it's a crisis of carbon dioxide. We don't have enough of it. And whatever we can do, making cement, making steel, put more into the atmosphere, you are saving the planet by doing that. We see in the past that the oceans have warmed and cooled. And we have proxies, the bottom one there is just from some uh, oxygen isotopes and car carbon isotopes in planktonic organisms, ocean surface temperature is up and down over the past. Just because it's gone up in your lifetime doesn't mean that you've had anything to do with it. So we see from the surface of the oceans and the fossils that come from the surface of the ocean that the surface of the ocean is very, very sensitive to temperature. This is ice core data showing the last five glaciations within our ice age and you'll note on the far right, it's not very warm compared with previous interglacials. We've had temperature rises and falls extraordinarily rapid and extraordinarily intense. I, hate, I, I really hate to depress you, but you're not living in exciting times. You're living in very boring times. There's nothing much happening on the planet. We hear these horror stories about sea level changes and how sea level is going to inundate all these Pacific Atoll Island nations. Well, we know from the past sea level has gone up and down by 1,500 metres. Our current sea level uh, has risen in the last 14,500 years about 130 metres. Uh, sea level has actually gone down in the last 6,000 years because we've come out of the peak of our interglacial. So, Sea levels go up and down, but you never hear about land levels going up and down. These are some satellite photographs of Pacific Island atolls showing that since we've had satellites, what's happened to the atolls? They've got bigger. Well, we should know that because Charles Darwin wrote a book on coral atolls and coral reefs in 1842. And he picked up an idea of Charles Lyell from 1833 and Darwin argued that we had sea level with a coral atoll sitting on top of a volcano and as sea level rose um, or as um, we, we had um, a falling of the volcano, then we basically had the atoll continue to grow. Charles Darwin proved that in 1842. It was validated by drilling of coral atolls for the nuclear testing in the 1950s. We have known for a very long period of time that if sea level rises, the coral says thank you very much 
and it just grows and grows and grows. And this is a complicated, busy diagram showing in blue the sea level rise and in green the temperature change. There is a, a rough correlation, but what is interesting is that in the far right of the diagram we've got various great periods of time. And the great empires existed on planet Earth when it was warm and when we had high sea levels. Warm weather doesn't kill you. It's the cold weather that kills you. This is why we've had stories about Jack Frost for a long, long time. So sea level rises are quite normal. So is land level rise. This is in northern Norway. We had Scandinavia under a few kilometres of ice. That ice is gone. Scandinavia has risen. And these are old beaches up to 340 metres above sea level. So um, we're quite comfortable with the sea levels rising and falling, but what about the land levels? Some of you might have been to the port of Ephesus mentioned in the Bible. That's 15 kilometres inland, seven metres above sea level. What's happened? The land's gone up. Nearby is the ancient city of Lydia. I've been down the main street of Lydia in a yacht. And so obviously the land level's fallen. This is taken in the Great Barrier Reef and there's a, a layer there of um, shelly material about two metres above the current sea level. And that has been dated. That material grew in the Holocene Optimum um, thousands, about 4,000 years ago. The chap with his hat on uh, is Bob Carter, who had performed at some of these conferences before, the late Bob Carter. This is showing us that land level has either risen or sea level has fallen. In this case, it's sea level that's fallen. These are micro atolls which have died. Um, this is a fresh micro atoll. This is what happens to the coral micro atolls when sea level changes. When you expose coral, it dies. That's got nothing to do with humans. That's natural events. So we know from looking at the past that there are natural cycles. And these are the pulling apart of continents, the pushing back together of continents, having a bad galactic address and getting covered in ice, uh, having uh, the orbit of the Earth change, having the uh, sun put out variable amounts of energy and lunar tidal nodes. We have cycles of climate, and when some of them coincide, you will get a fairly rapid climate change. And just to finish off, what does the past tell us? Well, it tells us that we're living in boring times, that we have uh, water and the air and rocks and life all working together. Nothing has changed since those iron formations formed. Climate change is quite normal. Massive climate changes, very rapid climate changes. Humans have survived. Um, we have had climate change ever since the first day on this uh, planet. And for most of time, it's been warmer and wetter than now. For most of time, sea level's been higher than now. We are living in those sort of extraordinary times. We seem to forget that carbon dioxide is the food of life. It's plant life. Most of the world's carbon dioxide doesn't end up in the forests or the grasslands or the rangeland or in crops. It ends up in algae. We don't see it. It doesn't get measured very much. So my story is that we don't measure what's beneath our feet. We don't really know what's going on in the oceans. But we have some very good clues that oceanic heat and carbon dioxide is greatly underestimated. We also see cycles of climate and accidental events, such as dirty big volcanoes or an asteroid impact, which have an effect on climate. Now, if you can't read this, it doesn't matter. If you can't read it and you're colour blind, you've got real problems. Um, the argument I'm putting up here is in our current interglacial, and they last for about 10,000 years, and we're now overdue. Um, we've been cooling for a few thousand years. If you just look at the periods of cooling and warming in this last interglacial, we are in the period of modern warming. What do you think the next colour is going to be? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage, President of CFACT, Craig Rucker. Oh. 
Thank you, Ian. That was a uh, great, great talk right there. And, um, you know, I, I think this is the first one I've ever seen you speak in the United States. Usually I see you in an uh, IKE conference in Europe or chasing uh, some of the UN conferences around the world. And that Australian accent, I mean, anybody else could give that. But as an American, when you speak like that, it just seems so the much more authoritative. So <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I think uh, this uh, Marlo Oaks, I guess the treasurer of Utah, it was supposed to speak next. Um, I think his plane got delayed, no doubt climate change. <laughs> and uh, yes, and it may surprise you, I am not Marlo Oaks, uh, so I will not be talking. Our next speaker, we're going to do a change of plans. Jim Lakely came up to me and said, Craig, you're not no longer in a batter circle, you're up. When Jim Lakely tells me I'm up, I take his charge seriously. The only one I listen to more at Heartland is Keeley. So she tells me I'm even more afraid. So anyway, who are, our change in plan, like the A-team, love it when a plan comes together, is going to be Mark Morano. He's going to speak next. He serves as uh, CFAC's Communi Director of Communications, runs the Climate Depot News and Information website, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, I've known Mark for quite a number of years, actually met him, and this would be no surprise to those of you who know, well, Mark, myself, James Taylor, and others, is smoking cigars. Uh, I met him at a lot of these UN conferences as he, we flew around the world. I never saw him in Washington, though he was working in Washington at the time, very often. It would always be in some far off place in Kenya or Indonesia or whatever. Uh, but I got to like the guy, you know. I'm, he's, I'm a little bit older than him, but we're roughly the same age, and uh, we bonded as pretty good friends. And uh, when you're at these conferences, there's not a whole lot of climate, you know, skeptics or realists at them. So you seek each other out, had the cigar thing in common, became good friends, and when circumstances presented themselves, of course, I had to hire the guy. Anyway, Mark began as, uh, he's a Virginia native, uh, he went to George Mason University and uh, after doing some political work, uh, began his career being Rush Limbaugh's man in Washington. Now, how many of you remember Rush Limbaugh's original show he, when he was on television? Anybody? Yeah. Well, Mark was that guy, if you remember that at all, who would always be in some sort of disguise. He would never show his face, kind of like Home Improvement, the guy with his, you'd just see his eyes, he'd put on a hat. And he would interview and do um, interview a lot of liberals who didn't know what he looked like, and he'd catch them off guard. And Rush loved it and would always put him on, uh, you know, his little segment. It was very humorous. And uh, one of the highlights of Rush's TV show, short-lived though it was. After that, uh, he was picked up a lot for his filming with by American Investigator, and did some great series. One in particular on the rainforest, which got my attention. As, watching it was just a fantastic takedown of some of the false claims that were me made about rainforest loss, some that uh, Patrick Moore brought up here, you know, saying that we're going to lose all the forests in a decade or so. Uh, I used that in order to invite him to speak to our collegians, and uh, again, it was an excuse for more cigars. Uh, he went from there to a pro service called CNS News, and uh, he did some coverage for Brent Bozell's outfit, and then was picked up by Senator Inhofe and worked for the Environment and Public Works Committee uh, for a number of years, uh, really taking over that website. Uh, he was a powerful force in getting out climate realist information for quite a number of years and uh, really uh, stoked the left. And they were infuriated because this was coming out on official government you know, website information that was uh, actually just going against the, the face of everything Al Gore was saying. And he was powerful, you know, just a powerful tool in that until 2006. If you remember that election, that was the one when the Democrats pretty much cleaned house. And uh, one of their first priorities in taking over that particular committee was to shut Mark up. And uh, it took him a couple years, but when Mark came to me, he was kind of panicked and saying, Craig, they're going to shut me up. Can I come work for CFACT? And I said, well, oh, let's see if we can scrounge up the money. We did, and he came and he started as our director of uh, communications. And uh, a lot of people were wondering if he stepped down from 
uh, the Senate Environment and Energy Committee or Public Works Committee if he would ever be heard from again. But boy, has he been heard from since. That's uh, far from being something that might cripple your career, he took off. Uh, Mark, starting at that time, uh, wound up uh, getting interviewed on pretty much every major network uh, you could imagine. Uh, in fact, uh, the journal Nature did a study and looked at the most quoted source, and they, they did this, of course, to attack skeptics. Who do they need to shut up? And they were looking at who's the one that's getting the information out there the most that is contrary to the UN IPCC narrative, and it was Mark Morano. At the time they did the, the study, he had been quoted some 4,171 times uh, by media mentions. And we're not just talking conservative, but also liberal media mentions. Uh, the next closest one was Senator Inhofe at 2,628 times. So he pretty much, uh, you know, well, that's significantly higher than even number two. So he's been a one-man wrecking crew on that. He's been called the uh, godfather of climate denial. Uh, I think it was Rolling Stone magazine that put that out. He's published three books. One's called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, Green Fraud, and his most recent one, The Great Reset. He's also done two movies with us. Uh, if you guys have ever seen it, Climate Hustle and Climate Hustle 2. Always like to brag, that was the number one movie in America for one night back in 2016. Stephen Hayward uh, called Murano, calls Murano the Pete Rose and Hank Aaron of the climate contrarians. If you turn on Fox News, he's, he's on pretty much every week. It could be Tucker one week, could be Jesse Waters the next week, could be Fox and Friends, uh, but he's also on a lot of other networks, uh, often maligned by the mainstream media, but a great guy, uh, a great husband and father to his wife Jennifer, and his, has a couple of his daughters here today. And, uh, and a great friend. So I welcome to the stage uh, Mark Morano, who will be talking, I guess, about the Great Reset, right? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thank the Heartland Institute for this opportunity. I'm going to talk uh, Great Reset today. You know, when uh, James and Jim asked me, they said, Mark, do you believe in free speech? And I said, absolutely. I think it's one of the fundamental bedrocks of our society. And they said, well, that's good, because you're giving a free speech in Orlando. So, <laughs> so here I am. Uh, great reset. Now, uh, I, I spoke this morning at a panel, but I just want to say that in March 2020, our entire climate energy debate changed, probably forever within our lifetime. It accelerated a lot of trends. What happened in March of 2020 essentially was the, the bypassing of democracy for COVID regulations. And the, the left and the climate activists were very jealous at first. And then later they're like, we got to do the same thing. And this had happened in Obama. They had the, the executive orders with all their climate stuff. And they were trying to, because he failed to get it through Congress. But they were lusting after the idea of just declaring an emergency and then doing whatever you wanted. Very similar to one party rule China. That's my book, The Great Reset. And yes, there is a book, uh, Justin, uh, Justin uh, uh, with the Heartland Institute, that their book with Glenn Beck. And we also have one, uh, a couple other ones. But uh, my book came out in uh, September of this year, past year. And I go through the whole, book, uh, the whole concept of the Great Reset, World Economic Forum. And I'm going to explain today how this is a multi-pronged attack. This was decades of trends that led to this. And our whole climate debate now is no longer in the democratic realm. At least they're, not, they're pushing it to keep it out of the democratic realm. This is Klaus Schwab. You know him. The pandemic is a rare, narrow window of opportunity to reset our world. He said this in June of 2020, two months after COVID lockdowns hit. Every country must participate. You will be transformed. A reset of capitalism. This is coming from the Davos World Economic Forum. Uh, these are the people who came up with stakeholder capitalism. You don't evaluate your business on whether it's profitable. You get a return on your money. It's all about whether you basically meet woke principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, climate, environmental goals. Their slogan became, you'll, be own, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. This is right off their video. They later pulled this video. 
Uh, and many people, including Ezra Levant and others, saved the video on archive. They tried, they got him, you know, they, they, they gave away too much of their game a few years before. Whatever you want will be delivered by drone. Now, this is long before COVID, so you get the idea. There's stay-at-home kind of stuff here. You, you'll, you'll, you'll be, other stuff will be delivered. They even go so far as to describe you won't even own appliances. You'll rent one. If you need a blender, you hit up a little app, and then one gets delivered within minutes, and then, then you're finished with it. You, you come back, a drone will take it away. They have this arrogance of this vision of this great reset where bureaucracy is going to just be incredibly efficient. They predict a billion people will die of climate change, displaced. Meat, this is about meat, it's important. It's a, a, a occasional treat, not a staple for the good of the environment and our health, because that's one of the things they're doing. So what I'm gonna talk about today is very simple. These are the intentional collapse of modern society. They're collapsing our free speech rights and currency, along with that central bank digital currency, which I'll talk a little bit about. Our current energy system, which you know all about, is being intentionally collapsed for this net zero utopian vision. Our transportation system is being collapsed. And the, the, make no mistake, a mandate for electric cars and banning of gas-powered cars creates car shortages. That's all it can do, a la Cuba a la East Germany with the old crappy East German Trabant where you had to be on waiting lists for years. One government approved car was the Trabant and that's where it's gonna be here with that. So th we're gonna be like a Mecca with Cuba if we allow this to go through. And the, 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 the secondary phrase here is, this will happen if we allow it. We can't allow it. Our ability to own home and property intentionally collapsed. Our high yield agriculture, which I think Patrick Moore and some others are gonna be talking about it being intentionally collapsed to create man-made food shortages. And we're, we'll talk about that with uh, what's going on in the Netherlands. So in 19, I believe this was 1919, the Russian revolution is going on. The slogan for Vladimir Lenin doing the uh, czar, against the czarist Russia was the worse the better, worse is better. Now I've done a lot of interviews in the Great Reset and they're like, oh, you know, that's just not gonna happen. They'll never be able to achieve that vision and that's, I'm like, it's not really about achieving their utopian vision, whether it's on energy or the ideal number of people. It's about creating a massive amount of chaos, which would then put them in charge of this chaos. We're already seeing calls to nationalize the energy industry because the free market failed to manage energy. Every time there's a blackout, more calls to nationalize it. Once they create a food shortage, we've been warned by Al Gore, and the United Nations and, and people like James Hansen, climate will cause great food disruption. No, the climate policies will uh, cause great food disruption. And so once their policies cause this disruption, the intentional collapse, then they get even more power and do more of the same policies. And that, make no mistake, is how they're going to get us, this chaos and shortages, get you more likely to be open to eating insects as this protein source, more likely to be eating Bill Gates lab-grown meat which is different than the Impossible Burger, not the vegetable. I'm talking about lab-grown meat, stem cells from a cow or a calf, grown in a steel vat, cultivated for a few months, and then literally printed up on a 3D printer. Uh, World Economic Forum loves that idea. Hey, what's for dinner, honey? Oh, I'm making a steak, uh, one of those synthetic steaks. It'll be ready in about 20 minutes. It prints up uh, you know, three kilograms a minute or something. This is what they're literally talking about. They don't want to have us the old system. So this is a 1932 book. This is FDR's kitchen cabinet, Stuart Chase, an economist. In his actual line in the book at the end of the 1932 book is, why should the Soviets have all the fun remaking the world? Now remember, this was during the time New York Times was praising Stalin's land reforms in Russia, his five-year plans, the agricultural revolution. Roosevelt's cabinet got caught up in this. They, when he means by have all the fun, he means this vision of this ruling class elite being able to manage and plan and micromanage every aspect of your life, the administrative state. That's fun for these guys. And as I mentioned this morning, every era of history, the ruling class has tried to invent ways in which to make the rest of us lose our freedom, and they want to make us happy that we're losing our freedom. It's for our own good. We're protecting you from whether it's even terrorism or the climate or the environment or food shortages or is this chaos. We'll protect you. You just have to give up your freedom. And COVID was the exact example of that. But in, 19, in this book, in, for Roosevelt's Kitchen Cabinet, 
He envisioned, this is incredible, control of banking, credit by the government, control of energy sources, hydroelectric, coal, petroleum, control of transportation, railway, highway, airway, control of agricultural production, state control of communication and propaganda, their phrase. What's amazing about this, they didn't achieve that all then, but these, this has been their goal. So they wait, it's lie in waiting. They wait for that crisis to push this. So what's happened, I think, since March of 2020 and why everything's changed, just in terms of politically for us, the once free West is copying China's one party rule. This is the World Health Organization sent a sham investigative committee in January, February of 2020. Go see what's going on in China. At the time, China was locking down. They had the hazmat suits. They were telling people that people were dropping dead in the streets, if you believe the videos, and they were doing a complete lockdown. Well, Anthony Fauci got on board, Neil Ferguson, and the WHO, World Health Organization, said copy China. Italy did it, and then it came to the United States and globally, and we all locked down. Uh, Neil Ferguson said if China had not done the lockdown, the year would have been different. So this was done like, thank God for China. That's their mentality. So the once free West for years has lusted after this one party Chinese style rule. This is Tom Friedman on the pages of the New York Times. This wasn't like, oh, he said it in a blog or he was in an interview. One party autocracy certainly has its drawbacks, but it's read by a reasonably enlightened group of people as China is today. Don't you know they support climate change? It can also have great advantages. The one party can impose the politically difficult but critically important policies needed to move a society forward. The, this is our ruling class, pages in the New York Times, praising China's one party rule. United Nations climate chief, Christina Figueres, uh, former chief, she lamented US democracy as detrimental in the war on global warming and lauded one party China for, quote, doing it right on climate. Apple CEO Tim Cook a few years ago claimed China aligns completely with Apple's values. I mean, who could not look at China and just think, wow, they're so impressive. They're aligned with all of my values. Cook defended the Communist Chinese Party as very fixated on doing the right things to avert climate change. So all you with an iPhone, ditch it. Of course, Google phones and Androids probably know better. But anyway, the point is, this is the, co the corporate government collusion. Justin Trudeau, 2013, there's a level of admiration I have for China because their basic dictatorship is allowing them to turn their economy around on a dime. Wow, good work, China. Uh, German economic professor uh, Anthony Mueller, the lockdown and, his consequence have, and, the, and the consequences have brought a foretaste, a permanent state of fear, strict behavioral control, job loss, growing dependence on the state. So remember that chaos that, that, that Vladimir Lenin used against Tsarist Russia. The more chaos you have, the more people dependent. We saw this when I was in the US Senate, they would pass these, try to do cap and trade and as a compensation, to raise energy bills, the government would then come in and subsidize the poor. Well, that's a win-win. You get to have your Democratic donors get all the wind and solar and subsidies and make energy expensive. At the same time, you get more voters dependent on the government to pay their electric bill, which means you have more voters to guarantee your reelection, more people dependent on you. Lockdowns in this situation were very similar to, I would call it a climate solutions on steroids, because for years they talked about planned recessions at these global climate summits. What was a lockdown except a massive government induced recession? And they didn't work. Uh, in, in terms of COVID renowned Stanford epidemiologist, John Iannonis, there was a clash between two schools of thought, authoritarian public health versus science and science lost. And I think you could change the words there for authoritarian climate science versus science and science lost for the climate debate as well. Klaus Schwab is, a, is, you say what you will about him, he's a master strategist. He says, we penetrate the cabinets, like an old Bond villain uh, that you'd see. And he brags about people like Justin Trudeau, half of his cabinet, cabinets throughout Europe. It's an amazing how the young leadership program that he's indoctrinated, much the same way Al Gore has his up climate apostles that he pushes forward. The Great Reset, these are some of the cabinet members and officials and people tied with the Great Reset. Um, we penetrate the cabinets around the world. You can watch the video of that. And when they say follow the science, this is really what it's about. The science, and you all know that in this room, the politics leads the science. So if you hear the science with a trademark next to it, it's anything but the science. Uh, Thomas Sowell, I think, put the best summation. Experts are called in not to provide factual information or analysis, but 
by officials to give political cover for decisions already made. So whenever you hear about, well, the experts say it's because politically that's what they decided the experts were going to say, not because the science of any kind showed it. Otherwise, you wouldn't end up with kids in a green bubble for band practice during COVID because this was public health following the science. This actually happened. That was in Oregon. Governor Newsom, uh, well, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, Governor Newsom, lockdowns made billionaires richer. He actually was asked about this and he said, how can you say we're hurting the California economy? We have all these new billionaires. We're leading the world in the creation of new billionaires. Our economy's doing great in California. Well, how can you, you criticize? We all wanna be prosperous, right? How can you criticize Newsom for that? Well, here's the problem. During these lockdowns, workers lost 3.7 trillion in earnings with the biggest thing happening to young people, women, uh, and minorities actually too. And guess how many, and billionaires made about the same exact amount. The pandemic created a new billionaire every 30, uh, 30 hours. So it was the largest transfer of wealth from poor middle class to the wealthy. All the mom and pop restaurants crushed, but hey, Amazon was open. Government unelected bureaucrats without a vote of parliament, Congress, city hall, town council, churches closed, weddings, funerals canceled, backyard barbecues. You could get rewards if you snitched on your neighbor. They could have their utilities cut off if, if you have too many people in your house. Vaccine mandates, mask mandates, but the big corporations stayed open. Walmart was open, Amazon boomed, big tech boomed, Zoom all the small businesses, and this was always, it's harder to control the small businesses. So in terms of waiting for that moment, that crisis, don't let it go to waste. That's why lockdowns were so important to this agenda. Also, Anthony Fauci, hey, he made, so his net worth soared 12.6 million during this lockdown. And everyone making the decisions to lock down and keep these lockdowns, none of their jobs were dependent, whether it was public health official politicians or the big media that supported it, they were never gonna be affected by these lockdowns. They all had jobs. In, in Australia, I don't know, Ian Plymer was up here, but Australia seemed to have lost its mind during the pandemic, probably the most authoritarian response next to China. And Canada would be a close second with Australia and then maybe, maybe New Zealand after that. Uh, but they were had to, authorized under emergency powers, break into any land structure, vehicle, whatever force, direct a private movement of people, put people in quarantine. They had quarantine camps set up. They had track and trace apps. You go to a grocery store, six hours later, you get an alert. You were near someone who later tested positive. You might be eligible to go into a forced quarantine camp. Well, guess who, but Bill Gates, the number two funder of the World Health Organization, thinks the whole world should emulate. He can't say China, because it's a little too far. We should do exactly what Australia did. And why do we care what Bill Gates thinks? Because this man, tens of millions of dollars to the media, buys his own media, and most importantly, he is the number two donor to the World Health Organization, which is seeking a pandemic treaty now. Bill Gates, next to the United States government, owns the World Health Organization. And they're also beholden to China, the World Health Organization. One of the best things Donald Trump did was withdraw funding and support for the United, from the United to the World Health Organization. If you think the UN is bad, you haven't looked at much into the World Health Organization, much, much worse. So part of the thing they play is the language. This is Merriam-Webster Dictionary. They redefine the word anti-vax, not to be you're against vaccines, but if you were against vaccine mandates. This was a shocking uh, thing. So now anyone who didn't get their sixth booster was an anti-vaxxer, and that's the war language that was a corporate government collusion. Justin Trudeau said, how do we tolerate these people? It turned into an incredible demonization. We learned all this. My talk this morning is what I learned, the, everything I learned in the climate debate applied to COVID. I'd already understood it. And this was one of them, the demonization and attack of climate skeptics. Well, he went after unvaccinated and said, uh, how do we tolerate these people? In a very, I don't want to be accused of Godwin's law, so I'll say a 1930s Germany way there. No one knows what I'm referring to. Bill, uh, Bill Maher, who now is, I'm, you know, I'm willing to welcome Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Naomi Wolf, Bill Maher, these are, uh, Russell Brand, Jimmy Dore. We have to build a new coalition. It's not left-right anymore. It's freedom versus tyranny. Bill Maher said of Justin Trudeau, I thought he was a cool guy. And then I read what he said about how do we tolerate the unvaccinated. It's like tolerate, now you sound like Hitler. And he said, this is HBO's Bill Maher, cor corporate America. So the idea of a permanent climate crisis, they all, they all did this with COVID. We need a permanent pandemic because of the power. Scottish government seeks to make government powers permanent. 
Jane Fonda said COVID was God's gift to the left because it basically gave them everything they wanted without the messiness of democracy. Slovenia, drivers must present COVID certificates to refuel their cars. You see what's happening here. This was what happened. You're spending, and this is now central bank digital currency. This is the UK Telegraph. Your spending is now restricted to what the government deems sensible. This past year, 2022, Joe Biden issued America's first exec, um, central bank digital currency executive order. We're now moving toward this sort of cashless society. And look at how frightening this is. Digital cash could be programmed to be ensure it's only spent on essentials or which that which an employee or government deems to be sensible. So you want to use your own money to buy meat, tobacco, uh, alcohol, fuel up gas or keep your thermostat a few degrees cooler. That's not sensible. That's not a sensible expense to the government. This is what's coming down, and this is the ultimate corporate government. When Justin Trudeau didn't like the trucker protest, he literally picked up the phone. First of all, he declared the Emergencies Act, which made them into domestic terrorists. He picks up the phone, calls the bankers, and says, I want you to cut off access to all these truckers, their own money. This wasn't like, we'll cut off access to services. The truckers couldn't access their own money that was in these banks. And then if you made a donut or coffee for them, you would have access to your money cut off as well. He also had their insurance canceled for boot. That is corporate government collusion. We used to call it fascism. This is Donald Trump's national security advisor, uh, Flynn, after careful, Chase Bank, after careful consideration, because of his relationship with Donald Trump, they didn't like it. They considered an advisor to Donald Trump a quote, reputational risk to Chase Bank and they canceled them. Now there was a huge outcry and they later came back on, but we've seen similar stuff with uh, Airbnb. If they don't like your politics, they take it away. We saw it with the GoFundMe sites. If the, if the ruling elites don't like the cause, they take the money and uh, they were gonna give it to someone else and then they ended up being forced to refund it. But we're not far from the day where you're gonna have your card decline. I think I'll talk about a little bit here about the, the MasterCard and the United Nations teaming up to have the, uh, um, teaming up to have the carbon footprint cards and it cuts off your spending when you hit your max. Big tech censorship is government censorship. We saw Anthony Fauci and the head of the NIH colluding to stop the Barrington Declaration. We've seen the United Nations claim they own the science on climate change. We saw the Biden administration providing lists of names and they're all shut down. It's not like, oh, these are private companies, they can do what they want. This is absolute government farming out its censorship in violation of our First Amendment. Flicking the kill, governments embrace internet shutdowns as a form of control. In these pandemic planning sessions, Event 201, Rockefeller, they talked openly, and in the preceding ones right before COVID hit, they had these simulated events with actors and movies. So they talked about misinformation and shutting down the global internet, global communication to prevent misinformation. So they're going after your speech. This is New Zealand Prime Minister actually said, we, the government, will continue to be your single source of truth during COVID. Trust the government. Of course, Anthony Fauci, I am the science. The UN declares we own the science and the world should know it. And of course, Google partnered with them to make sure that results from the Heartland Institute or anyone else, uh, Anthony Watts or Climate Depot, would be suppressed. This is how they do it. Love this quote from John Kennedy. This was during the founding of uh, Voice of America. We should not be afraid to entrust people with unpleasant facts, foreign ideas, competitive values. A nation afraid to let people judge the truth in falsehood in an open market is a nation afraid of its people. They are terrified of us. And the idea, the key line in this is judge the truth in falsehood. That's what they don't think we can do. That's what the whole world of fact checking, in fact, CFACT is being, uh, our website, uh, we're being investigated for a possible fact check, uh, you know, these ratings groups that come out. COVID climate reset, the next crisis is already waiting for us around the corner. It is the climate crisis, Klaus Schwab. So Richard Lindzen, who's here? I use this in my book for my key climate chapter. I love this quote. It's from Richard Lindzen in 2009. I don't know if you remember saying it, but it's hard to imagine a better leverage point than CO2 to assume control over a society. If you gain control, you, so to speak, control everything. Well, they imagined it. Uh, a fear of a virus that was weaponizing our breath became actually even more powerful than uh, than carbon dioxide, and they were able to achieve everything they wanted. It called a flu d'etat overnight. We basically became part of the Green New Deal. Everything that ever wanted was uh, uh, implemented immediately. A stop of air travel, school promise of the free health care, status quo, ability of people to sit at home without working, receive a paycheck. This was the fantasy that they'd had. 
World Health Organization, climate is the greatest challenge. This was done a year and a half before COVID hit. So they're set. Remember, co climate cannot stand on its own anymore. I do not believe. I believe it's going to be climate, COVID merged together. I'll explain here in a second. Climate lockdowns. I won't spend too much time here, but it is interesting. The origin of the phrase lockdown is a prison term. Uh, it's meant to control the movement of inmates. This is interesting. Eva DeBoer, UN chief uh, climate advisor, 2013, said the only way we can achieve these temperature goals is to shut down the whole economy. Well, gee, that's, that's seven years before we actually did shut down the whole economy. November 2019, a few months before we were verifying COVID and before the hysteria hit, the UN demanded, this is from the UN website, 7% yearly cut in CO2 just six months before COVID lockdowns began. 7% in November 2019, follow me. By December 2020, one year later, guess what? World carbon dioxide emissions fell 7% in 2020. Now, do you want to bet against the UN? They called it, it happened, and they got exactly what they wanted. I was impressed. I don't know how they did it, but that, that was eerie. I was doing searching this and I came across this. They called 7% and then it happened. 2021 demand, C continued lockdown-like emissions. Actual headline, UK Guardian, global lockdown needed every two years, needed to meet Paris goals. There you go, it's all we gotta do, just have lockdowns every two years and we can finally solve global warming. Why can't people just go along with it? COVID lockdown helps save the planet. It's, it's, it's not only good for the virus, but it's good for the planet. How can you, you lockdown deniers? So here's what's funny. They'll say, oh, this is a conspiracy. The last Heartland comments, we had the UK reporter here. Climate lockdown is a conspiracy. A Bill Gates, George Fund, Soros funded professor in Europe, Mariana Mazzucato, coined the term climate lockdowns. She said the world may need to resort to, to lockdowns again, this time to, clap, to cl uh, tackle a climate emergency. So they're using it. Their experts that they fund are using that under a climate lockdown limit private vehicle use, banned consumption of red meat, expose, impose extreme energy saving. So remember, climate didn't, uh, COVID was not wasted. These emergency powers immediately pressure on Biden to declare a national climate emergency from Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, many Democrats in the Senate, climate activists, Scientific American, we're living in a climate emergency, we're going to say so. Here's the key, you go back, and I mentioned this earlier, but the fall of the Roman Republic through the Middle Ages and throughout history, the Third Reich, the greatest abuses of human rights occurred during these emergency powers. Politicians love and abuse them. This is a BBC analysis about, uh, about these uh, emergency power abuse. Uh, the similarities between 9-11 and the abuse of emergency powers. What happened during 9-11 were all terrorists. The 2001 Patriot Act, which was uh, sort of derivative from the 9-11 terrorist uh, emergency power, which we're still living under that emergency act, has not gone away, allowed domestic surveillance of our citizens. And this is why one of the reasons during the school board, angry parents at all these school board meetings, they were declared domestic terrorists by the Biden administration. We're still living in the 9-11 climate uh, uh, terrorism emergency, and it just keeps getting extended. It's bipartisan. COVID emergency powers were ineffective. Uh, they found out that the response, bottom seven of the surveyed measures, so they don't even work. Interestingly enough, and according to this analysis, even when you declare a natural disaster, uh, a, 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 use emergency powers for natural disasters and de declare a disaster area, they don't really help anything with the disasters. Uh, the body count, controlling for disaster, it doesn't really matter. So all this political pressure, we gotta declare a disaster area, it doesn't actually help the area, according to the BBC analysis. Biden could declare a climate emergency as soon as this week. This was last summer, and there's now talk for him renewing that in his final term in office. Estimated to give him 130 uh, different powers. And again, this is what they're looking for. They don't need Congress, don't need no stinking democracy. This is the CO2 monitoring card I mentioned, shuts you off when you hit your carbon max, corporate government collusion, or in this case it would be corporate uh, international organization with the UN collusion and World Economic Forum. The International Energy Agency went kind of weird. I always thought they were more of a normal organization when I was in the Senate. They gave a lot of good data. They become very woke, for lack of a better word, which is now considered a racist term, by the way, if you say woke, according to Soledad O'Brien of CNN. Anyone who uses the word woke is now equivalent of using a racist term. But their 2001 International Energy Agency report urged behavioral changes to flight, cl fight climate, a shift away from private car use, upper speed limit, thermostat control, limits on your hot water. Keep in mind, 
This isn't a Greenpeace blog or Sierra Club. This is the International Energy Agency report. UK-funded report, absolute zero. Same language, urge climate law to stop flying, no new roads, airport closures, stop eating beef, stop doing anything that causes emissions. The last one is chilling, whereas uh, Greg Wrightstone will appreciate this. Regulate carbon dioxide similar to asbestos. Now, we inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. So can you imagine we're going to need hazmat suits for everyone in this room if you get near anyone? This is in their report. I read the transcript. This was debated on the, in the, the UK government, this report. And what was sad was that all of the ones that were supposed to be on our side fighting against this, they were terrified to challenge any of the premises. They were sort of the, oh, not so fast. Me too, I, I won't challenge it. Very disappointed. Journal Nature, COVID lockdowns key to begin personal carbon allowances. Restrictions on individuals unthinkable have us more prepared to accept tracking and limitation. British Medical Journal calls for meat, dairy, price hikes, substantially fewer car journeys, 80% drop in meat consumption. You see where this is going? These are major medical journals now. We're not talking again. I just, we're not talking about, oh, I found some obscure quote from George Monbiot. No, this is the actual power centers of our science, government, corporate, academia. 230 medical journals declared COVID-19 response the template for climate. Well, what does that mean? No democracy, emergency powers, imposing, doing whatever you want, a la China. It's very clear about what they're doing. Freedom of movement. Electric vehicles won't save us. We need to get rid of cars completely. You'll go nowhere and be happy. Let's update that. This just happened last month. Biden administration, new strategy to address climate. Don't leave your house. They're looking for more remote work, virtual interactions. Does that sound like a world you want to live in? This is where they're headed with it. Scottish government also just declared era of unconstrained growth in car use is over. Pete Buttigieg, every transportation decision is a 21st century, is a, is a climate decision in the 21st century. Every transportation decision is a climate decision. Owning a car, outdated 20th century thinking. Make no mistake, they're not coming after gas-powered cars. They're coming after cars, including electric cars. They're also coming after your home. Hose, houses pose more danger to climate than vehicles. Rethinking home ownership. This is a professor at UCLA Urban Planning. Given the scope of the climate crisis, we need another kind, away from our ideologies of ownership. How many of you here are guilty of any kind of ideology of ownership? Ideology's bad, bad. They want you to go toward a more collective, healthy, and just uh, city. Owning something creates social injustice. This is according to the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, Vancouver. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset. Uh, it's private land ownership is a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, therefore contributes to social injustice. So basically, if you own land, that's a racist act. You'll own nothing and be happy. Don't have to worry about it because Bill Gates is buying it up. Bill Gates, they were worried about China, Bill Gates, who's gonna own the most farmland. I'm happy to report that a homegrown American, Bill Gates, has stuffed China and is now the single largest farmland owner. But here's a question. Do you want Bill Gates? Who would you rather be the America's largest single farmland owner, Bill Gates or China? I, I, I'm not gonna, I have to think about it. It's like Jack Benny. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. You know, it's a hard one to answer. Bill Gates, according to NBC News, America's biggest farmland owner, and here's what I like, NBC News reports, he's not the one in overalls. He's not the one on the tractor doing the farming. He's the landlord. Oh, really? For a second there, I was thinking this was Green Acres and Bill and Melinda were out there and Mr. Haney was trying to sell him a rusty old tractor, but no. Why does Bill Gates want to own this farmland? Why does he want sway in agricultural policy? His whole goal is lab-grown synthetic meat, investing billions of dollars, grown in the steel vats that's going to replace meat. He doesn't want anyone in the developing world to eat actual uh, you know, uh, livestock-made meat. He wants you to eat his lab-grown stuff. Great diet research. This is what I was telling you about. Six kilograms of meat an hour. They brag the machine can print up to this fake meat, this synthetic meat. World Economic Forum really wants you to eat insects. Good grub. Drink up. Cockroach milks is the protein drink you didn't know you've been missing. And here's my favorite. And I think David Legates is going to be talking about nitrous oxide. But here's the gist. Your urine, your pee, is now a dangerous warming agent. And how come you say, it's in the Scientific American, it's a peer-reviewed study in the journal of Frontier and Ecology. Eating too much protein makes pee a pollutant problem. Pee can contribute to global warming. So there you go. So we need to stop peeing, you need to stop exhaling. 
very simple steps we can take if you care. What do I have, doctor? Climate change. Official doctor in Canada, diagnosed a patient is suffering, had heat stroke, and of course, they also want to add climate as a cause of death on death certificates. You see where this is going, nightly death toll counts. Harvard School of Public Health links COVID and climate. The root cause of climate increases pandemics. We need to take action to prevent the next pandemic. So this is it. If you don't support the Green New Deal, the UN Paris Agreement, you are a grandma killer because they're gonna end up leading to unchecked climate change, which will then lead to more viruses. That's the new memo. And I'm not, again, this is the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm not pulling some obscure blogger and say, oh, look, this is what, no, I'm not doing this for entertainment. This is, they're screaming this at us right now. Anyway, climate change will make pandemics more likely. This is Journal Nature study. Climate, COVID-19 is awful. Climate could be worse. That's Bill Gates. The reality, of course, destroys the claim. I think this is from Anthony Watts. Uh, what's up with that? Yes, Anthony Watts. 100 years, then uh, almost 99%, almost 99% drop in death when they're trying to scare you that climate's going to kill everyone. The big news right now, you'll see this next week and coming days, this new pandemic treaty. And this is the Washington Post. They call it a radical pandemic treaty. One Bill Gates-funded scientist, the WHO, will be able to declare a, a public health emergency shut down globally. The Biden administration is trying to commit us to this treaty, makes the uh, UN Paris Agreement look like, uh, you know, child's play. This is really one of our biggest fights to fight for freedom. Next up, your kids, is having a baby in 2021 pure environmental vandalism? How many people have engaged in environmental vandalism here? Uh, I'm good, okay. Um, If you're speechless, that's because climate change is the cause. Climate change is accelerating the loss of language and maybe common sense, I don't know. So keep calm and trust the experts. Which experts should you trust? The EPA chief, he was just at the Ohio train derailment. Trust the government, that was his message as he gingerly sipped that water, I noticed, uh, in the lady's house. Uh, And by the way, train derailments, 2020, Greta Thunberg blessed, blamed on climate change because of bad weather. So the New York Times, critical thinking leads to misinformation. Don't go down the rabbit hole of, of critical thinking. Now, I'm talking to you, Patrick Moore. I'm talking to you, Ian. Stop this critical thinking. This is getting in the way. It's not helping in the fight against misinformation. You must not do your own research when it comes to science. Why would you? Just trust the government. The government will be your single source of information. You've heard it over and over. Questioning authority had been too much of a good thing. It's killing people. Let me change it. You're all killing people because you're questioning it. Stop questioning. Let's let people live. And I love this, Slate Magazine. It's time to give up on facts. Uh, what the hell? All right. Just, or the, actually lay them down temporarily in favor of a more useful weapon, emotions. That's why Greta says, I want you to panic. Why? Because then you can't think logically and you'll go along with whatever crap they're pushing. Economist Milton Friedman said, free societies, the kind we've been lucky enough to experience for the last 150 years, are a rare exception in human history. And this next line is frightening. Most people, most of history have lived in tyranny and misery. We can never forget that. We can't just assume that the American experiment is going to continue on when we've allowed all these threats to go unchecked up till now. So the lowest level of politics was the greatest power against the whole COVID lockdown led to the dropping of mask mandates in San Francisco, Washington, Baltimore, New York, Philadelphia, because angry parents changed the election in Virginia, almost toppled a governor. Democrats did uh, focus groups, got terrified that their own base wanted it to end, and that's where they lifted all the, this is according to the New York Times, lifted all the mask mandates and vax mandates in all the major cities. We need emergency power reform. We can argue all you want about persuasion, but we need to stop this, and this is from Competitive Enterprise Institute, we need to stop this cycle of declaring emergencies. And the problem is we're about to get a climate emergency declaration. There's also gun violence declaration. There's a misinformation public and all these public health emergencies. So the great reset should be the great resist or the great reject. And that's how you should talk to your friends. Uh, and I just say this, the year, this has been the time when conspiracy realities have outnumbered conspiracy theories. All of this will only happen if we allow it. So thank you very much. CFAC, appreciate the opportunity. Sorry, well, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Right, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, we did ask you to pinch hit at the very last minute, and that was a home run. So thank you, my friend. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but we're going to try to get right back on it. Uh, the next panels begin 
outside. They technically begin at 2.30. We will try to start them as close to that as possible. I realize that does give you four minutes, so don't stampede. Uh, take your time, but uh, the program begins again for the rest of the afternoon, and uh, have a good one.